The HD 6790. When this card was new nearly seven years ago, it was sold for right around the $150 price point. This was the 1050 Ti of its day and now can be purchased much, much cheaper. Is it worth picking up? Or if you're stuck with one now, what sort of games can it play and at what settings? How I came across this particular card is kind of actually interesting. So, this card was originally one of my buddy's cards. He gave it to me in exchange for some computer work that I had done for him. He had originally purchased two of these back in 2011 and put them in Crossfire in his particular system. However, Crossfire is as hit and miss as baseball and as annoying as trying to rationalize with a tween age girl, so he ended up buying a GTX 570 very shortly after. The second card was sold to his friend, and the card that you see here was packed away in storage and crammed in a basement for nearly six years with only a couple weeks of actual use. So despite this particular card's age, it's damn near in pristine condition. Inside this XFX design shroud, you'll find a Bart's LE GPU with 800 Terascale 2 shaders at 840 MHz. 40 texture mapping units, and 16 raster operation pipelines. Although this chip shares similarities with the HD 6770 and 5770, it does have a larger memory bus width of 256 megabytes over the 128 of the latter. The HD 6790 also comes with 1 gigabyte of GDDR5 with a 134.4 gigabyte per second memory bandwidth. With support of up to DirectX 11, we should still be able to play almost all of the games out there. So let's boot up a couple and see how they fare. The first game that we tested was Player's Unknown Battleground. This game is notoriously unforgiving on low end hardware. The HD 6790 struggles in this game even at the lowest settings at 720p. At those settings, we got an average of 23 FPS. It's certainly not competitive as there is noticeable input lag in between key presses and the resulting action, and when in more densely populated areas the frame rates would drop down and occasionally dip down to 8 with additional spikes in frame times. This game would be much more enjoyable on a GPU with more VRAM as this card was pegged almost the entire time. We had a similar result in Doom at 720p with a 50% render scale. Although the frame rate was acceptable in this game, we had to drop the settings down to PS1 levels before we got a smooth experience. Again, this game requires a bit more VRAM to play well, and the result certainly does show that. Killing Floor 2, on the other hand, was a dream to play on this card. We managed to crank up the settings to medium at 1080p, and at these settings we got a nice 51 FPS average. Although not a perfect 60, it still ran smooth with only stutter during the beginning of the rounds when the maps were loading in. If KF2 is your game, this card would be more than adequate. In Grand Theft Auto V, we managed a very nice 78 FPS average at 720p low settings. Even during the most particle effect heavy rampages, the frame rate rarely dipped below 42. And while just relaxing in the vanilla unicorn, we got a buttery smooth 102 FPS. The card had a mediocre performance in Skyrim Special Edition. At 1080p low settings, we managed to hit V-Sync, but the frame rate did occasionally stutter and drop down into the upper teens. All things considered, though, it performed well enough for a budget card from seven years ago. In more optimized titles like Star Wars Battlefront, we got a fantastic 53 FPS at 720p medium settings. This game is probably the best looking and performing game on this card with it only ever dipping down to 50 when enemies filled the screen. With Battlefront 2 coming out, you should probably expect similar to slightly less performance with this card. The last game that we tested with this card was Overwatch. In Overwatch 720p, we got a pretty positive performance. As this game is competitive, having over 60 FPS is critical at all times. This card not only never dipped below VSync, but also played at over 100 FPS most of the time. 
If you can tolerate lower frame rates, you could easily increase the settings for a more visually appealing affair. For a budget card of seven years ago, it's really not that bad. For a budget card of today, it's nothing special. It's not really great in modern AAA games and really does struggle at 1080p. But there are no bad cards, just bad prices. So if you can find this card really cheap, it would make a welcome inclusion in any budget bashing build. That's about it for this episode, but if you'd like to see certain hardware tested, make sure to let me know. I always read the comments. As always, thank you folks for watching. May your frame rates be high and your prices low. And I'll catch you folks next time.